Welcome everyone and uh, good morning, afternoon or evening, depending where you are. Uh, thanks for joining us for the fourth session of our Modern Product Data Workflows webinar series presented by Business Innovation Brief, CTO Universe, Project Management Update and Product Management Today, sponsored by Looker. I'm Hannah Flynn, the Site Manager of, Site of Product Management Today, and I'm excited to bring you these sessions today in the space that are bringing you hard earned insight about product data and embedded analytics. Uh, and so I'm really looking forward to our session today where I'll be talking with two participants in what I'm sure will be a very interesting conversation. And don't worry, it's being recorded in case you've missed any of our previous sessions. So before we go any further, uh, I wanna thank Looker for sponsoring this webinar series and helping us to make this happen. Looker is an inventive software company employing business intelligence to make data accessible to organizations and data analysts by focusing on the intersection of economics and engineering, helping customers use data to achieve success. Through their fresh approach to business intelligence, Looker helps businesses thrive with easily accessible and consistently defined information. So thanks again, Looker. Uh, so on that note, please feel free to ask any questions during today's session. You can do so by submitting them into the question panel on the right side of your screen. Uh, we'll try to answer as many of them as we can uh, throughout and at the end of the presentation. And lastly, if you have any audio issues during today's presentation, you may wish to dial in by phone. And you can do that by selecting the more button in the upper right portion of your screen and then just select the switch to phone option. And our lovely Shelly will be answering questions, feeling them in the question box today. She'll be happy to answer any questions that you have, so make sure to say hello in the question box. So today I'm talking to Ian Thompson, who's the head of business intelligence at King, and Zara Wells, who's the strategic customer success manager at Looker. I'm really excited to talk to them today. Uh, Ian has a very unique perspective on getting product managers up to speed with data, and then Zara can really bring it home. So Ian, why don't you take a uh, Take it away, get us started. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Ian Thompson and I work at King, as we can see here. Uh, King is a leading interactive entertainment company for the mobile world and I will talk to you today about product analytics. So firstly, who at King? Uh, over our time, we've created 200 titles and last year King released figures of 270 million monthly active users. We have offices all over the world with the majority of the employees in Europe, but we're expanding quickly in the States. And we've been part of the Activision Blizzard family for a couple of years now. King is 15 years old. Uh, we initially started out creating competitive player versus player skill games. And seven years ago, we launched our first title onto Facebook with a mobile release a year later. And these are some of our most popular games and franchises, which you may have seen before. So who am I and, and why are you listening to me? My name is Ian Thompson, and here's a smug picture of myself. I've been at King for five years. I am the head of business intelligence platform currently. And my focus uh, has always been data and the usage of data and researching and planning solutions for problems that we can solve with data in the business. So my story here, uh, when I joined, I was initially hired as a, a ClickView developer and worked in that area for a couple of years. And for those of you who don't know what ClickView is, ClickView is a data discovery um, product for creating guided analytics and dashboards. I then reached a bit further back in data warehouse with my focus on it being used in ClickView. In 2017, we discovered how powerful uh, and well-received Looker was inside King, and I've been lucky enough to spend the last few years owning the business intelligence offering here. So today I want to talk through King's journey of, of product analytics, uh, touch very lightly on the, on the tech and people's attitudes over the last five years or so and we'll pop back in time and first take a look at the sudden growth of King and the org structure at the time. And then we will look over three case studies to see how they took place back then. And we'll pop back forward in time uh, to present day or last year and see how things have changed and how the arrival of Looker has affected the landscape. 
Uh, finally, we wrap up with some of the challenges we're now currently facing and areas that we need to focus on. So I was lucky enough to join King uh, during the crazy spike we can see here. And this chart is originally an indication of our gross bookings, but represents all things uh, such as King's employee numbers, data volume, number of players in our games and so on. Uh, this obviously led to hunger and investment to improve, as well as the ability to undertake many projects which, which just weren't feasible before. Uh, the data teams are under huge demand from all areas of the business and had to quickly improve the infrastructure to cope with the new data volumes, as well as the up, upage in usage from the rapid increase of our data users. So as I said, let's pop back five to six years. So back in 2013, uh, this is our org structure here, uh, and we had the end business users in yellow, who would consist of product managers and their, their team, um, some game developers, finance, marketeers, and custom service teams. They would sometimes have some analysts or, or data teams uh, in pink, which work with them, and they work between uh, the data teams, so myself, uh, and then the, the end business users. I was working in the reporting team, um, and generally I'd be aware of, of what's going on in the business and what's going on in the data warehouse. But I would sometimes engage, or I would try to engage with, with the yellow teams and the product managers. Uh, we'd, pro we'd have to prioritize our work between all of the different stakeholders across the business, and a lot of the time it was a case of, of getting what you were, you were given or what was currently available, um, rather than creating relationships with each other and, and having the time to spend. And say, we were spiking and uh, there was a lot to do and the tech just wasn't keeping up. This would often sort of result in watered down information or, or slightly straying on a different path because we'd receive our requirements through data analysts. So I want to go back over three case studies and, and how they played out five years ago with the current technology, attitudes, and the org structure we've just seen. Uh, and we'll look at how we analyzed A-B tests and thought about and tuned level difficulty in our games and how we rolled out new games in the form of what we call play tests. So I don't wish to get technical here, but uh, it's very important uh, to how our organization is able to interrogate data back in 2013. So often data is aggregated into summary data set, also known as a cube. Uh, this is mostly due to two reasons, to negate raw data volumes and the thought of self-service BI in the organization. A simplified example of a data cube which we relied on heavily was what we refer to as the mobile cube. And we would group all devices from the same platform, such as iOS or Google, um, the same country, the same install cohort, and we would have pre-calculated metrics, such as gross bookings and retention. So in the example, in the example that we can see here, um, we have one row of data per customer, per product and per time period, and all the metrics or measures are pre-calculated in, in a colored box. For example, customer number 123 on the 1st of April for product number 789 would have a quantity of two items and a total dollar spend of 100. This is likely how data is served up in your organization. So now onto A-B testing. Uh, A-B test is a randomized experiment with two or more variants, A, B, and so on, C. In this example here, we want to test the impact of changing the app icon. The default icon is first square icon, and the variants are the round icon and the square party popper icon. The first step is to plan the test, and that involves deciding exactly what we want to test, where we're going to test it, and who will test it on. It's important to have a hypothesis to compare the results against when the test is finished. 
The next steps are to think about what areas of the product uh, would change due to this test and what we would need to measure. This last step is important since sometimes it is not possible to get hold of information. It may not be tracked in the application or it may not even be within your application that the action happens. In the example here, we don't actually track App Store visits, um, but it might be possible to get the approximation of third party from third parties or get this information from the App Store API. So to be able to produce analytics on our tests, there's a core set of data we need to store. General information about the test, the split of the population between the variants, and then which users are assigned into which variant. Once we're sure that we can track the measures and run the test, we can work on summarizing our data, so creating a data cube, in order to analyze and create our hypothesis, check our hypothesis. And here we have uh, our data cube, which we can see is measures for each date, country, test name, and version and variant of the test. So from this data cube, we can get any number of different analysis out with the aim this data is to compare things to the control group, which is case number zero. So the hypothesis should always be proved or disproved by this process. And here we can see a result of how daily active users has been affected over time by each of these control, uh, against each of these control groups. So it looks like case number two is tracking the control group, although slightly lower, but case one seems to be disengaging some of our users over time. So pushing the data cube we saw previously into our tool of choice, uh, which was ClickView, uh, allowed product managers and data scientists to see all the predefined measures split by all the predefined dimensions in order to form a conclusion and test that hypothesis. So moving on from our solution, it would usually be followed up with some further requests more dimensions and more measures, which may have been impacted by the test that we didn't originally think of. And of course, it'd be great to check everything to make sure that implementing a change would not affect our game negatively. But given the solution of using data cubes, uh, it's not that simple. Additions and edits to the data would be prioritized by the data team and eventually worked on and released. Another area which is hard to package into a data cube and analyze was the random assignment into the variants of the test. Uh, so Ian, a question for you. In this model of performing A-B tests, uh, how many people would be involved in each test and of members of which teams and how long would they, would they go on for? Uh, how long would each test be carried out for? Uh, so it depends uh, what we're testing, um, but mm -hmm. we the all, all setup we have here is we have a, a game team, which is the developers, and then we have a, a what we call a business performance unit sitting between uh, the data teams and the developers, and they're the ones that come up with hypothesis and then create a test to test that hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And that would consist of um, one what we call business performance manager, uh, a producer of the game which is a product manager, and then uh, up to sort of three or four data scientists, potentially. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, I just thought that our audience might be might be curious to hear this. This may reflect some of their experiences, and for others, it may be completely different. And so just to contextualize it a little bit for, for those who are listening. Sure, sure. So just mentioning about the assignment, the random assignment into our variants of the test. This is something that um, usually after the hypothesis have been proved or disproved, someone would then usually go back and just confirm that um, the random split of our users into the variants um, was, was fair. So it might have been that unluckily the randomization might have put in a lot of large payers into a certain variant or a lot of very engaged players into uh, a variant. So those kind of things also need a checking, which is hard to hard to push into a data cube. So um, my second, sorry, sorry, before we go on, we had one last uh, audience question that was just about the the A B tests uh, really quickly, and then another one that I'll ask a little later. But uh, um, could you just uh, reiterate what the time frame is also for your your A B tests when you're uh, when you're carrying out those? 
Sure, uh, that is really dependent upon uh, what we're testing. So, you know, it could be a couple of days to a couple of weeks. Uh, we're in a lucky position where we've got hundreds of million users that we can fill our assignment up straight away and we all, almost get um, instant results back from, from our testing. So we don't have to wait until our, our um, populations are full or hit a certain size. It, it happens quite quite quickly. That's pretty nice. I'm sure that there are some audience members who wish they had that luxury. Great. For sure. well, thank, thank you for taking the time to answer that. All right. So my second use case uh, is looking into tuning level difficulty for some of our games. So um, this might not be something that you've thought about before, but uh, we have a sweet spot of between a hard and an easy level here. So if we have a, a very hard level, you know, there's pros and cons about having such a hard level. So we can lose people because they are stuck on the level. Uh, but the positive of that is that sometimes we improve the chance of people spending or converting to a spender. Um, having a hard level also boosts sort of a sense of achievement or satisfaction that, that people get when they when they finally have passed it and it, it builds engagement into the game. Um, and something that's a bit harder to measure is the virality of, of some of these hard levels, which we'll see in a moment. Um, some having a, a too easy level uh, obviously keeps players in our network, which gives us potential to, to use them to either convert to a payer or cross promote to some other games. And we're all about building a, a large network here. But again, that, that comes at a cost where the game just turns very boring and we end up losing people as well um, in a different way to a level being too difficult that they churn. So ideally, we sort of, let's say we want to hit the sweet spot there of being right in the middle. So here we're looking at a level editor for Farm Hero Saga and given the analysis of testing some of these hard and easier levels um, these are some of the kind of changes that can be applied. Uh, it can be a, a balancing act such as uh, removing what is known as blockers uh, and we can see on level 157 on the left here that some ice has been removed uh, but also we've removed some water wells which increased the challenge because they need water to pass the level. And we've uh, removed some of the green grass patches as well there. And on the right hand side on level 211, um, it's quite a minor change. And all that's happened there is there's two game tiles that have been added to the board, which would slightly increase the chance of matches. So there is a legend of level 65 in Candy Crush Saga, uh, and this is a notoriously difficult level. And it's been debated many times uh, within King and has led to the creation of some great analysis and thought of how to tackle tuning level difficulty. Uh, and this is just a quick sample of, of showing the, how the virality effect um, for hard levels are. And I personally remember playing on this level um, back in the day, even after it had been made easier and it was still very, very difficult. Oh, I do too. <laughs> Yes, I, I definitely do, and I wanted to have some stern words with King. So I guess today is my uh, is my day. <laughs> it's a good achievement when you get past it. Yeah. Um, so, sorry. We, we had one quick question uh, just while we were talking about level sixty five. Uh, an audience member wants to know: Is there a way that you measure the the level of virality? Do you have any metrics that you're using for that? That's always been a, a really difficult thing um, mm -hmm. to do, and we do use the Facebook API to pull uh, information on, on some of our uh, home pages for Candy Crush or some King pages. Um, but, but yeah, these things are very, very difficult because you, you have to compare it to a baseline and uh, looking at friend networks as well in Facebook. Mm -hmm. We also used to have a lot of sort of sharing in Facebook, I passed this level or asking for lives. So a lot of those things uh, used to get analyzed. We're not so big on Facebook now with the rise of mobile. Um, and it might be fair to say that those uh, pop-ups that everyone used to get many years ago were very annoying and irritating to people. <laughs> so those kind of things have, have died off a little bit, but virality is definitely something that we still look at. Um, it's the same as the way, I guess, that we analyze TV marketing. Uh, there's no tracking on TV marketing, so it's very difficult to attribute that marketing spend to an actual uplift in, in any kind of measures or metrics. But 
uh, it's just comparing against the baseline and that's what some of our data scientists do some clever things there which I stay well out of the way of. Got it, thank you. Uh, so this slide here just uh, shows some of the analysis that was built ad hoc by a data scientist uh, with queries directly against the database uh, for this exact purpose. So it might be a bit small there, but uh, on the left hand side we can see just the number of players in our game slowly declining and then we have some blockers or, or the first unlock in the game. So the game used to have a feature in it where you used to need to wait to unlock a certain uh, episode or get friends to help you to pass that. Um, and then we can see the drop off of level 65, which is quite significant there. Um, on the right hand side, we have some analysis from a data scientist, just, uh, just to prove a point really, showing the revenue that we've achieved on level 65 uh, for people that have passed and people that have failed, and then the future revenue after level 65. So obviously all the people that have never passed level 65 will never get the chance to even spend any money after level 65. So the decision was taken to simplify level 65, um, and then they carefully measured to see if it firstly had the desired impact of keeping players in our game. And we can see later on it's been made slightly easier yet again. The, um, I've stripped the axes here because uh, legal wanted me to, but that, that change is um, that the attempts per success is quite staggering that people are staying in the game uh, and they really want to pass this level. And it, it's just a real testament to the game teams that managed to get that engagement with their level design. Uh, and secondly, we wanted to make sure that we negated the negative side of making the level easier, which is the loss of bookings. So they've analyzed later on to see if you know we pick that back up after so this date coincides with when we made the level easier and we can see that maybe the bookings have tailed off a little bit but they've been boosted in the future levels there so we're gaining money from players who may have quit so as previously said up to these this point uh, these kind of analysis would happen around specific levels um, with ad hoc analysis looking into areas that were perceived to be important at the time you know, the toll of writing all of these queries and producing analysis for specific levels led to requests of automating this process and packaging it into reports so that the project uh, product managers could make decisions themselves without the assistance of data scientists or the data teams and this would, of course, mean another data cube. And over time, this would be touched up more and more to include more and more measures and dimensions. Uh, and people would really want to drill down into pay player behavior. So with the time between iterations of these things usually being several weeks, it was, it was not an ideal process. So my final case study, um, is to look at the, how we release new games. Uh, we would carefully manage these new games, and it was usually when the game was just being created, wasn't fully productionized, and it would need to hit certain target results around retention and other engagement metrics uh, in certain aspects of the game to be able to fully productionize it. So the way that we did this, we chose a, a small market which replicated a larger market, such as Canada would for the US. Um, and that would be because if we released the game and it wasn't quite up to scratch or we made a lot of ad adaptations, we wouldn't want to burn our audience in the US. Um, obviously, we don't want to burn it in Canada, but it's less of a risk in these smaller playtest countries. So each of the playtests would be planned and incrementally built, and each playtest would focus on a, an area or aspect of the game. And it would be important to have analysis ready after the playtest period is over in order to tune the next playtest build looking to be released in, in a few weeks. And the problem was everything was up against Candy Crush. So uh, if your new game playtest was similar to Candy Crush, then you would have to benefit from the reporting and data tools that had already been put in place. However, any features or aspects which were not similar to Candy Crush you would end, end competing with Candy Crush and you would lose for the attention of the data teams. So a data scientist would be the go-to in this situation and the playtest team would get as much as possible from what might happen to overlap with Candy Crush, but 
not for anything non-standard, uh, usually fell to the data scientists to produce. Did that create any sort of weird dynamics internally um, with the, the competition aspect against King's own product? Uh, for sure. Um, in terms of uh, cannibalization or, or competition of art for our users inside Candy Crush, that's that's mm -hmm. always a, an issue and, and that was of course looked into as well. Um, mm -hmm. But the people working on the playtest games, it would obviously be the most important thing to them. However, uh, Candy Crush was still still peaking and, and the numbers are all going up and it was the majority of our user base and the majority of our um, revenue. So mm. it was very difficult to divert our prioritization uh, to these smaller games, which may one day become a Candy Crush, uh, but just, just not yet. It needs its time, of course. That's so interesting. So with the growth that we experienced as well, these were tough times and the data teams and the tech really suffered. Uh, this meant a bigger focus on sort of standardized reporting and ensuring that this was robust and performant. We used to have problems in the night of our um, data pipelines and sometimes the new day's data wasn't ready until the afternoon, which is just not good enough. So a lot of time and effort went into shoring up that process rather than focusing on things such as playtest games with any, if we had any spare time. So, Moving forward now to 2017 or present day, um, and we can see what's changed, improvements of technology and the attitudes to analysis here at King. And we can revisit data cubes. So with tech improvements, we've been able to move away from data cubes and path driven analysis, uh, which data cubes tend to lend themselves to. Um, big data is not really a thing anymore, and it's just data. Uh, databases have improved a lot faster and faster and we've managed to move away from um, click view as well and read the data on the fly so we don't package up all the analysis before we give it to someone we can allow them to read the database directly and pull exactly what they want when they need it truly moving into a self-service bi world so rather than a data cube here, we've got an um, uh, entity relationship diagram, which is uh, how we visualize the database. And it's a classic sort of customer and product order pipeline there, where if someone decides that they want to pull something new into that, such as returns, uh, they can. So we don't have to wait now two weeks for it to be prioritized and worked on and then sent back and checked by the user and we'll talk about how we do that now. So in 2017 we went through quite a large um, org structure change, reorg, and this quite horribly complicated diagram is actually quite simple uh, when you know when you understand it. Um, so we had a data team focus on each main stakeholder in the business gave them a single point of contact and allow the data teams to get closer to the business. So we see analysts and data scientists now and product managers in these stakeholder teams in much the same way. We don't always talk through the analysts or data scientists and we have a much easier discussion with everyone involved. The reporting and data warehouse abilities have been spread across these uh, stakeholder focused teams and all underpinned by a small core team maintaining the platform and the data model. Uh, this new org structure as well comes with the addition of the grey box, which is the BI platform team, which we will talk about in a moment. So moving on to Looker at King, um, and at the time we didn't know that our org structure had lent itself so perfectly to the strengths of Looker and uh, how I feel data should be used in an organization, knowing what I know now. Um, but the way I describe the BI platform team is, is the grease between the business and the data. So when we implemented Looker, we wanted to make sure that people felt empowered and that we didn't blow our first chance with our users like we had done in the past with ClickView. Um, ClickView had little understanding and person-to-person -person support at King and users felt it was a bit too rigid. Uh, being fair to ClickView, 
Uh, most of the issues were actually with using data cubes, but now the time is right, given the technology and the reorg, that we were able to release a new BI tool and nurture the attitudes of people. So we would work closely with users of all kinds, but targeting business performance units, more specifically business performance managers, uh, business performance directors, uh, and product managers. Uh, these people would tend to win or lose us the battle of the company-wide adoption for our rollout of Looker. Uh, all assistance was tailored to the individual or team, but generally speaking, we worked on understanding data and driving adoption of, of Looker. Um, more specifically, we discussed data, we would talk about KPIs, uh, new and existing, how these KPIs were used in the business and how they should not be used, um, what they meant and how they were calculated. We talked about the tracking in our games and what data we collected, what data we did not, what data we needed to collect uh, for calculating new measures and explaining if something was not collected, why it wasn't collected. We discussed dimensions and measures which we use in our current reporting and again how and why these existed and what new ones might be of interest to these people and how they could use them. And again, did we need to implement new tracking in the games to be able to get these things that people were interested in using? So it also focused on training quite a lot. Um, and we give a lot of face time uh, to get our users to feel comfortable with, with the new tool, Looker, and the data trying to leave them with a solution which they had the skills and the drive to enhance over time. Uh, we produce a wider tool set as well. Um, it's really boiled down to sort of tying all, all the steps previously together so that people have the confidence to branch out into our other tooling. Uh, and just have some self-experimentation going on really where if they had any problems they had the skills and abilities to overcome them as well. So the result of all this meant our user base in Looker had rocketed to 800 people in just over a year without the need to actually force users off ClickView and into Looker. Uh, the benefits of Looker itself had a viral effect inside the company power users emerged to effectively, uh, in effect, to grow our team of two uh, into a larger team spreading the word of, of Looker and the BI platform. So the true self-service nature of the tool, uh, along with the flexibility of analysing exactly what people wanted, uh, rather than be constrained by what was available in data cubes, uh, really drove that as well. And the knock-on effects of this was that data teams now had the time to really focus on important business problems rather than data problems. So with this new world of the reorg and tooling, I wanted to quickly go back over our case studies to show what our solutions are as, as of today. So uh, A-B testing first. Um, if we did it today, it would look much the same. However, we wouldn't be using data cubes behind the scenes. Um, the solutions can be undertaken by a range of, of teams now, uh, and the solution can be discussed and can happen in live time or very close to live time with POCs um, showing users what's available and getting them to sort of build themselves something. So uh, the interaction there has changed rather than chucking something over the fence to a data team and getting it back later to having an open dialogue with people and building something together. So the way it would work is that uh, a data team or even a, a power user would build a uh, an A-B test model in Looker um, and it includes all the sort of main data sets. If people wanted to add something to that, as we saw when we talked about the revisiting of data cubes, it was possible to add another uh, set of data to that model or just even just a dimension or, or a measure and we had the end user just contributing and talking to us we would talk back to them and we would work on the solution together the best thing as well is that we can analyze what's used and not used so we can analyze ourselves and see what's important to our users and what's not and then work 
uh, even with the warehouse team to improve the offering directly in the warehouse, given that we have proof of how powerful some data is and some data is not. Level difficulty, it's the uh, same old story. So we'd build or assist with a foundational data model and nurture users through its use and uh, adaptation. Uh, and this is much the same story now and tried and tested process, which creates an agile solution without having to wait weeks and weeks between the updates. So here are some illustrations of kinds of reporting that we have now and have been built entirely by look at end users. Uh, this is just a chart of attempts per success by the episode in one of our games. And this is to make sure that we can spot areas in the game um, which, as we covered in the original use case, are either too difficult or too easy. Again, completely created by end users. Um, or game developers in this fact in, in this case uh, and this shows the breakdown of our bookings per day filtered to a specific level again to monitor the level difficulty changes and its impact uh, and finally uh, again another self-created analysis by one of our users uh, this is bookings over time uh, for each of the episodes in a game for a specific cohort of players So revisiting how playtests are, are done um, and the fact that prioritizing between a, a fully fledged game with a lot of data and reporting already and a playtest game with little to no traction is, is still a, a sort of non-contest. Uh, but the utilization of Looker and the changing attitudes of product managers has meant that they can actually achieve a great deal more uh, even without a data team. So Looker has also freed up a lot of people's time meaning more in-depth discussions around what we need to improve for a playtest game uh, can easily be analyzed with the use of Looker uh, and the power can be given over to our users. It, it makes uh, it's quite a reasonably simple process now. So much like the A-B test use case um, we saw earlier, these charts have been created entirely by end users. So in this case, this is the business performance unit who are working on the playtest game. Um, so this was actually built on top of a standardized sort of KPI model that um, me and my team have built, which we've distributed across the business. And it empowers the users to edit that model uh, and build on top of it. So they don't have to do all the groundwork of building out standard KPIs, but in this case, uh, they are looking at the first time user experience uh, funnel where we can see major drop-offs in the game. This obviously isn't built in the standardized KPI model, um, but they've inherited what we've used and just improved it a little bit specifically for their game. Uh, and here we can see a comparison of, of different playtest builds of the game and, and how their attention compares to each other. Uh, there's a, actually an error on here. Um, again, <laughs> not me, built by someone else, but these are not 0 0.033, it's 33%. Uh, and finally, this crazy chart here, um, and I'm not here to say whether it's good or not. Uh, the wonder of the way we have an operating model with Luco and the stakeholder teams is that um, this might have been exactly what the product team are after, and yet requesting this uh, would have been hard enough, and having a data team get it exactly right is unlikely to have happened. Uh, so we empower and trust our teams across the business to be data savvy, and if they're not, then they can receive training and assistance. Uh, and for those of you who are interested in, in what this is, um, we've got the bar chart, which is the installs, the line charts are day two and day seven retention and the dots i've never understood why this is important but it's uh, the ratio of day two and day seven retention um obviously very important to our, our product managers <laughs> i like how upfront you are about that but yeah i can imagine this would be an, a nightmare of a chart to uh request but it it's the relief that you would feel getting exactly what you need it's probably pretty sweet Exactly. The, the, the phrase that we often say is, is why, would, why would we, the data teams, build something for you when you know exactly what you're after? Um, mm -hmm. And if you don't, we can, we can assist you with ideas or get your thinking into a certain way, um, mm -hmm. but we will never be able to just create something that, that you know or that you find very, very useful. 
uh, maybe after a lot of talking and a lot of prototyping and back and forths, um, but we find it just works so well, this model. Definitely. So uh, this has taken us to present day now and we're still not finished. Some bits and pieces that we still need to get done with the way that we operate with Looker here. Uh, we're moving um, some of our data into Google Cloud, which will allow us sort of machine learning capabilities, which can be integrated directly with Looker. Um, with all the content and models that people have built themselves, it's inevitable that we'll need to do some housekeeping and tidy up some unused content. Uh, we've, we've heard from some of our users that we do actually need to create some, some more centralized content further to sort of standard KPI metrics as it would free up a lot of their time and it's quite a simple task for us to do given that we have a great understanding of the data. Uh, and finally, we just want to keep growing the ecosystem of and around Looker uh, by more integrations and tools and services and producing sort of automated and accurate reporting and solutions that just means that, that other people don't have to worry about it. Uh, and that's me. All right, thank you, Ian. I'm going to switch over to Zara to be the presenter. Um, and we have a, we have a couple questions, and I'm going to ask one while Zara gets her screen shared. Um, how long does it take a product manager to be trained on Looker and to begin pulling data and generating reports and generally be self-sufficient? We, we find that varies massively. Some of the um, sort of business performance managers uh, move into that role from you know, maybe being a data scientist, in which case it's, it's quite an easy task. Um, sometimes they're quite green to data, but generally our hiring here is, is with data as a focus. So it makes my job quite a bit easier. Mm. Um, it, it varies massively, but we don't give up on people. And that's the beauty of have not us, of, of, of my team not having to actually own any sort of data models and reporting is that we can literally sit next to someone for a couple of hours and mm. we see that as a good investment. And seeing people work up to a level where they can go off and build whatever they need is, is great. With the last playtest game that we had, um, we've had rave reviews of, of just how much data science time it saved, allowing that team to actually do data science, which is a huge problem in the data science industry that they end up doing data engineering, really. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's great. Everyone's time is getting respected. Um, all right. Well, Without further ado, Zara, why don't you take it away? Absolutely. So um, hi, everyone. Just as a, a refresher, I'm Zara Wells. I'm the Customer Success Manager at Looker in the UK office, and I look after our strategic and kind of enterprise accounts, such as, as King. Um, one of the, the beauties of what I do it, and, and working for Looker, it means that I do get to engage with a variety of verticals and, and product managers within those. So it's pretty cool working with people who are effectively in the same line of work, but looking at different types of products. So um, gaming, obviously the perfect example right now through to money transfer platforms, applications for healthcare, that kind of thing. Um, but what's really interesting is Typically, the KPIs that people are looking at tend to be the same across the board. So the product managers I work with are all very interested in retention, churn, um, getting an understanding of the stickiness of the application or the, the product that they're building and maintaining, um, feature adoption, monetization, that sort of thing. It would be awesome to know what KPIs you guys look at, so feel free to kind of pop in the chat box the types of KPIs that are most important to you. Um, and we'll also come back to why KPIs are important from kind of a data perspective, of course they are, but in terms of getting that data as well. So one of the examples, I'm coming at this from a very high level, I just realized the um, resolution is not great on this, but um, Essentially, I'll just be reiterating all the great stuff that... It's actually, uh, Zara, really quickly, it's looking like your screen... There we go. Why don't you go back to the second slide now? It okay. just looks like you're getting frozen between the two of them. 
Oh, no. Can you see the monitoring churn and retention? No, we're seeing the, the title slide now. Oh, dear. Let me know. I don't know why that's happening. Hmm. All right. Is okay. that not what you have up? So I have the monitoring churn and retention slide up, which should be a visualization. It keeps freezing a little bit between the two. Really quickly, thank you everybody for bearing with us while we have this brief technical difficulty. Uh, Zara, I'm going to turn you off as the presenter and then put it back on for you. Um, so okay. you'll have to turn the screen again and we'll see if that works. The, the classic yeah. turn it off and turn it on again <laughs> solution. All right. All right, so I've made you the presenter again. You should be able to share your screen. Okay. Let's see. Is that it's still it's still showing up as this weird halfway in between one slide and halfway in between the other slide. Um, oh, but why don't you, can you go forward okay. to the third slide? Does that does that show up properly? Let's see. Tell me how that looks. That should be impact of changes to the UI and the UX. Nope. <laughs> no, nothing. Well, I can. Oh, I can. Now it's, now it's showing. Now it's showing. The second slide is showing now. The monitoring churn and retention. Okay, I'm not going to change. I know what that slide is, so I'm just going to loosely talk <laughs> talk to it, and then we can carry on, and uh, we can send the slides afterwards, and I'll just kind of talk through more generally anyway. Yes, we'll be sharing all the slides afterwards. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I feel like technical issues always happen with me, which um, people always think is ironic when you work in software, but it is what it is. <laughs> um, but yeah, so kind of going back, so um, the image that you should be seeing right now is, is just a screen grab from a very, what I consider boring visualization. It's, it's just a table, but it um, is the the visualization of choice for this particular product team. Um, I'm pretty sure we can share the name because it's a it's um, on our website, but this is from a Yahoo example from one of their product managers. So they have a number of apps. So you've got kind of the Yahoo News, Flickr, that kind of thing. And they're always looking at um, retention and churn across those. And the way that they do that in a similar way to King is they're doing that through cohort analysis. So you should be able to just make out that they're looking at this through device. And so they're looking at the people that have installed via Android and then the people that are on iOS. And for this particular example, they were really interested to understand what that drop off from um, those particular products was after two days and then the seven days as well. And the reason being that I believe from further analysis after drilling down um, and looking into things more deeply, they found that if people stayed or were engaging with a product for more than seven days, they were more likely to then acquire another one of the products. So for example, if someone has Yahoo Mail, they're more likely if they've been using that application for seven days to then download Yahoo News and kind of so on and so forth. So in terms of that stickiness, they're finding that the higher touch points they have across the different products, obviously the stickier that individual is. Um, so that was a really cool kind of learning for them. It wasn't something that they'd previously looked at. So in that sense, it helped from a marketing perspective. Well, we've already acquired this customer, so the lifetime value of this particular customer on app B is going to be far greater because we've spent less from acquiring because they've kind of been rooted through one of our, our other applications. Um, so all of that ties back to revenue and monetization, but also it helps the marketing team with spend um, and of course the product team as well. Like what is it that these people have done on this particular product that meant that they didn't come back? Is there, is there a correlation between device? Is there a correlation between, you know, the Android app store or the, the, the Apple app store? Just able to drill down into things like that. And um, again, another question for you guys, if, 
if you've done anything on kind of customer lifetime value, I find that stuff really interesting from a customer success perspective. We always love to know um, kind of how long people stay with us, really focused on churn, retention and that kind of thing. And of course, really important for a product. Um, so like I said, you can drill down further and make more decisions based on the data you have because at the end of the day, you're wanting to make product changes that move the needle. Um, so I don't know if you're able to see the next slide yet. It's a screenshot of a company called Venmo who were looking at the impact of UI and UX changes. So I don't believe we're seeing it now. Um, we're seeing okay. impact of changes from UI and UX, looker analysis by payment medium. Perfect. That's the badger. That's the one. Perfect. Okay. We did it. <laughs> yes, it's working. Um, so again, so we do have a YouTube video where Venmo talk about this. It's a relatively, um, it's a couple of years old, but it's still a really great use case on how they were able to look at the data to make a data-driven decision so um, that, that made an impact. So a really, um, I was going to take screenshots of the, the support messages that they received, but I think some of them had some naughty words in, so I didn't. But essentially what they did was they changed two of the buttons. So if you guys have Venmo on the bottom screen and the bottom of the screen, one button is kind of pay and the other one is credit. So a charge, sorry. And what they did was they made, um, I think they removed one of the buttons. So it was just to charge something like that. Anyway, because that flow from a user perspective was different, they didn't realize. So all of a sudden there was this influx of errors because people were paying people rather than charging people. Um, and there's some quite funny Zendesk conversations where it's like, oh God, I've just paid you three times. I've got no money in my bank account. How can I get this money back? The person oh. that I'm sending the money to won't talk to me. <laughs> like, it was, oh, uh, no. yeah, so it was kind of, kind of a big deal. And um, obviously this was rooted through support, but the product team had access to the support tickets and they were putting that into Looker along with the changes that they'd made to the tool. So they were able to see this particular UX change has completely flipped people's experience of the application. We're getting an influx of complaints. It's not easy to use. People are now questioning if they can continue using the tool because they're losing faith. We need to do something quickly. Um, so what they did was they jumped in and they reverted all of those changes back um, and obviously sent lots of apologies. Um, so they reverted those back, but again, you can see that massive, massive spike, um, which could be great if you were trying to move the needle on, I don't know, retention or spend, but it's not so great when it's errors. <laughs> um, but a really great insight in, into what products thought, right, this is such a great idea, it's going to make the workflow easier of people to send money, pay for money. But actually, when it was released, it, it wasn't right for the users. So what they did was they reverted back to their original um, layout. But they did then do some A-B testing because um, they wanted to change the look and feel. There was a branding exercise, but equally there was kind of a functionality exercise going on. So um, again, similar to King, they got two very small groups of users. Um, and changed the UI for them, but kept everyone else on the original. And then they gradually moved people over based on the results of the, the seed testing and the A-B testing. They moved everyone across to, on the next update, um, the, the layout and the look and feel that was most successful. They actually didn't manage to recover some of the errors, um, but it was better than kind of what they had seen in that spike. And someone was asking a question earlier about how long did they do that for? They actually did that for a really long time. I believe that AV test for this particular product issue was a good four to five months. Um, 
the reason being, I, from my understanding of speaking to Venmo, was they wanted to make sure that the decision they were making, it wasn't going to have to flip and flop. And also, I think the way that their user base works, we don't have Venmo in the UK, but from what I understand, you either use it all the time or it's just kind of a here and there once a month. So they wanted to make sure that they had the best impact to make the best data-driven decision. The other really good thing about this is, again, um, I guess in the same way that sometimes sales and marketing can, sales and marketing teams can have differences, and some product and engineering teams can. So what they were able to do to prioritize um, this particular change with the engineering team, they were able to show this data and essentially say things aren't great, we really have to move this to the top of the priority list rather than a pretty please, I'll make you a copy, I really think this is gonna help. So having data really informs and empowers people in decisions, you, you really can't argue with data. Um, so that was something that Venmo used um, and they continue to use, uh, look for their data, well, the data-driven decisions on product changes, um, which is pretty cool. So I don't know if you can see the, the next slide. I was kind of working on the basis that some people will just have our voices on in the background and maybe not be looking at slides so much. Um, but this is just a really simple one. So in terms of the change management side of things, um, which is something that I'm really passionate about, the way that um, other product managers have sort of made this work uh, and it depends on where you are as a business. And um, if you do have data readily available to you, then that's brilliant. But a lot of people that have come on to look at, they didn't even know, obviously they knew there was data, but they didn't know where to get it. The people that you need to get on side are obviously your data team. And that could sit anywhere. It could sit, for some people it sits in finance, operations, and um, Potentially, you do have a data team, uh, an infrastructure team, IT, whoever it is. Ping around, see who you can who you can find. There will some there will be someone who knows where to get you data. Ahead of that, sit with anyone in your team, other product managers. Um, a really good exercise that I recommend for this: get in a room. Always take food. Like food is the main way to get bums on seats. Take food, take post-it notes, and have everyone write a priority of theirs. Like, this is what I need for this particular KPI, which is linked to this company um, metric, something like that. So it could be, right, our thematic goal of the year is keeping every customer successful, which is the standard kind of thematic, very loose goal. Taking that down one step further, reducing churn. Okay, so our chair number needs to be at, you know, 105%. So how are we going to do that? Well, we have to do that through monetizing. So we need to make money on the application. So I need to know how much money is being spent in the application. Where can I get that data? Probably a finance uh, database somewhere or whatever it is. Sit down with all of your, your team. Work out where that data might be. If you don't know, that's fine. Someone will but work out what you need to be able to make decisions, what you need to have access to. Prioritize that. So on that, on a whiteboard or something, everyone stick your post-it notes, take a look and start moving them around to work out what those priorities are. If you go to your data team with that already laid out, these are our priorities. This is number one, two, three. They'll be able to say, right, well, we have the data for that. We don't have the data for that, and that's going to take a couple of months. Um, we need to find out where that data is even held. You can start coming up with a really good plan of when you're going to be able to start doing analysis on certain parts of the tool. So whether it's JavaScript for usage across your, your platform, your application, whatever your product is, or um, kind of signups. That's, that's all going to be housed somewhere. You just need to make it available to yourself. So as well as having your own KPIs for your product, you need to have KPIs for this particular project as well. So in a month's time, the KPI is like, we need to be seeing usage data or minutes. 
and in six months time we need to be seeing usage data minutes along with churn numbers as well um, so you can make those correlations so tracking all of that keeps you on on track it keeps your engineers on track as well and um, keeping them all up to speed and also with your data team they have so many other teams to work with if you have a plan for them and they can just get on with it and work with it they'll they'll work faster and harder for you because like I say, they have so many other things to do keep communication open so the worst thing that can happen is if um, and this is something that King do really well to avoid they don't want to build stuff for other people they want people to build it because they know what's best in this initial phase there is going to have to be obviously a lot of build done by the teams that know how to get data into the, a particular platform or whatever it is that they're using to run data keep that communication open engage with your engineers as well you need to know kind of say to your engineer what do i need to show you one way or another to to make a change in our platform if you're showing them something that you think is really important but it's not important for them they have no motivation to make that change for you so you need to back everything up and keep communicating with them and also and um, keep keep highlighting the wins that you have it's a really basic tip but it's things like we made this particular change in the product this drove an uptick of this amount, which then created this much revenue, or we added this new feature because we saw that there was a number of complaints about the way this hover bar works or the filter or whatever else. We added that and the stickiness, the churn rate lowered or increased, however you look at churn, um, usage increased, complaints dropped, support were able to focus on other things. Keep communicating those wins and make sure that you have that kind of, I guess, ROI on your time and on this data project as a whole. And that tends to kind of keep encouraging people to work with you. Um, and that's pretty much all I wanted to cover. So I guess it's more the holistic stuff of um, using data to make those data-driven decisions on your your products and if you have any questions or want to hear more about how I work with product managers feel free to kind of connect with me on LinkedIn or email me and happy to help where we can. Yes so thank you Zara. Um, I realize we've run a little bit over time. Um, I'm just going to set Ian as the presenter again so he can share his final slide which has some information for getting in touch with both of them. Um, so yeah, definitely reach out on LinkedIn. We have all of our previous sessions, um, recordings of them at the URLs at the bottom of the slide. And very soon we will have information on our two upcoming sessions, um, the final two sessions in this series. So thank you so much. Um, I realize we've run a little bit over time but I'm going to ask one quick audience question because I'm really interested to hear what both of you have to say. Uh, we have an audience member who's asked, um, with giving teams so much flexibility, do you ever encounter data maybe being misused with colleagues to make incorrect assumptions or selling to the business misleading stories? And how, how do you handle that, just given that Looker enables so much flexibility and accessibility to data? Um, yeah, I was going to say, Ian, do you want to go first? <laughs> uh, so that was a, a huge worry. Um, from lots of people actually across the business when we started rolling out with Looker and everyone started to get their hands dirty. Um, the facts are that we actually had that problem more before. And the reason for that is a lot of people went rogue um, previously and moved off our standard offering of, of BI and reporting because it didn't capture what they wanted to. So either they would instruct um, their data scientists to go and do something and they just bashed out a result which wasn't checked by anyone or uh, they may not have had the full understanding of KPIs. They might be great at um, stats, for example, um, and they're not so great at data engineering. Uh, and that was actually quite a big problem. People just exporting data into Excel and doing something crazy, whereas now most of the stuff is produced from kind of a, a solid foundation um, or it's just a lot more visible. So it's all in the Looker platform and we can run checks uh, on through Looker and see what's being used, what's not being used, where we're getting lots of errors, 
um, where we're looking at some really, you know, badly performing queries, which indicates something's wrong. So it's definitely the feeling that people had, but I would say, in fact, it's the other way around. Great. And Zara, did you want to add anything? Yeah, um, it's a really, it is a really good question. And it's funny because in a similar vein to what Ian was saying, when when we bring new clients on at Looker, we have the jumpstart thing. And, and that's, that's where I hear that question the most. When people learn how, I mean, this is an, obviously a, a Looker example, but everything is, um, everything is set on the back end of Looker without getting too technical. So you can't manipulate data. But of course, there are, there are always going to be people who know how to, to sell and you can't argue with that. But there is some really good, um, what I try and encourage is enablement. There are some, there's some really good documentation, presentations, information about how to help, I guess, end users like myself read data. So how to visualize it properly, you know, making sure that they don't use pie charts because they are the easiest thing to, to manipulate, even though I love a pie chart. Um, and it's just, it's enablement. So when, and, and challenging, I think when people get the right data, it enables them to, to challenge it and, and inspire conversations. So people then, they don't really have the space to be able to um, be ambiguous or also embellish because the data is right in front of them and it's it's all managed in the back end so what you see is is what you get that's great that's wow that's a really optimistic note to end on <laughs> thank you i'm glad <laughs> i took that question um so that's about all we have time for today i know we've run a little bit over so thank you to those of you who have stuck with us i hope you had have as much fun as i did and so thanks again to our sponsor, Looker, um, and to our guests today, Ian Thompson and Zara Wells, um, and, I'm, and to all of you for attending. Uh, I'm Hannah Flynn, and you can find Product Management Today on Twitter at ProdMGMT Today. So we've, again, as I mentioned, we have two more sessions after this. The details will shortly be up on the URLs at the bottom of the slide, where you can also find recordings of all the previous episodes. And thank you all for joining us and have a great rest of your day.